All right, guys, it's time for the next level guy show. A men's interview, interest, and improvement focused podcast featuring interviews with the greats from all industries to help you better your life. Each week, a new episode features an interview with one of the greats, covering all aspects of their story, from life hacks to tips and protocols that have allowed them to live life on the next level. We then highlight concrete action steps that you can use to improve your life. And now, your host, Ian Dawson McKay. And today, the guest is Danny McMillan. Danny creates daily videos on becoming a more emotionally secure, physically sound, and happier man with better connected relationships in your 40s. Too many people think life needs to slow down at 40, but Danny shows you that with some lifestyle changes and some emotional fixes, your 40s can be your best time ever. Danny aims to help men to reach their full potential, fostering masculinity with a purpose, building strong standards and boundaries, and respect in relationships and in life. He also runs Seller Sessions, which is the world's first dedicated marketing show for Amazon, FBA and private label sellers. No need to pay for expensive courses or overpriced masterminds. Every week, they dive into tactics and techniques that are actionable and delivered in bite-sized chunks and all for free. And now, let's get to the interview. Thank you so much for coming on. It's an honour to feature somebody who I've followed on social media. Now I've hit the dreaded 40, as people say. Mm. But for people who maybe don't recognise you or don't recognise the name, Mm -hmm. how would you describe who you are? How would you sum up who Danny is and why people should follow your channel on Instagram? Yeah, so the well, the first part is that, um, as you know, is that I've also got another podcast. We're up to nearly a 1,000 episodes. So in the industry that I operate in, um, they know me from my podcast, Seller Sessions. I also put on Seller Sessions Live conference each year and various different events that I speak at. I just did a world tour uh, earlier this year. So I covered um, Europe, UK, um, Australia, US. Uh, Where else did we cover? I think that's pretty much it, but there's quite a lot that we covered Just a few. (laughs) And um, yeah, and I work with brands uh, that sell on the Amazon platform as well as other channels that, you know, they range between seven, eight figure brands. Uh, people don't realize there's, there's like a community there because they go to Amazon, right? And you just think, well, I'm buying products from Amazon, but about 55% of the products bought on Amazon are what called third party sellers. So that's the industry I've been in since about 2015. So what was it then? That while you were in that, while you were selling, you know, while you were doing Amazon, you know, and you've obviously had a varied career. We're talking about music and stuff like that as well uh, before we started. But what was that turning point that made you think, okay, I'm seeing issues in my 40s, but I'm seeing that in other people? You know, Hmm. why did you create the channel? How has it become such a passion project for you that, you know, that you've created this fantastic channel, giving this great advice? Was there a turning point that caused that? What do you mean, uh, Men Plus 40? The ex- yeah. yeah. I mean, what was it that kind of – was there a, a, univ- a switch that just came off and you thought, no, I'm having this issue, I'm seeing my friend having this issue? You know, why Why was it – where was the impetus to start the channel? Well, the, it, it started before the, tra- uh, the channel. So when, if we go back to October 2020, right, so – Basically, we're in the latter part of the first year of COVID, right? Everything dropped in the in March. And what I did throughout that period in, in the summer, I was like, everyone's on lockdown. There's not much going on. So in my industry, I, I went on a bit of a, a run. I remember saying, right, I'm going to do a podcast every day. While everyone's on lockdown, let's just keep everyone motivated. So I've done 77 days in a row. And um, that was seven days a week. So we're dropping content on on a daily basis. Now, what's happened is for the last seven years, my health's been pretty bad with brain fog. So there's no real kind of diagnosis for it. So I spent 
seven years from around 2015. Basically, I spent tens of thousands on tests, consultants, supplements. And basically, the way it is with brain fog is that I would start my day, I'd be fine, right? First three hours, and then the brain fog kicks in, I'm done. So it's like a race against the clock to get as much work done as possible. And it's so deliberating that you lay down, your day's gone. And so it got to the point where I've done all these tests, consultants, done everything you could possibly manage and spent over 35 grand on it. Then on October the 4th, um, as I said, we're in the second half of that lockdown. So we're going into that winter lockdown. I just took myself into the garage and I said, right, I'm going to break my body down and rebuild it because nothing else has worked. Right. Mm. And in the end, I did 207 days in a row. I probably watched too many David Goggin videos. Right. <laughs> I end up putting myself in bed three times with fatigue, but then obviously I kept going. I just even, didn't matter how I feel, strapped my arms up, strapped the knees up, just went in there. And just to be aware, it might have been 207 days of consistency, but they weren't one hour long sessions and all intense. So I tape it up and down. The goal behind it was what can I do in order to we're in lockdown there's not much else going on the brain fog was everyone will tell you when you go to naturopaths or whoever and doctors nhs doesn't matter what it is you just got to relax you got to lay down you know take these tablets and it'll it'll you know it hopefully will work and you improve your symptoms and all these kind of Mm. things and then i did read something that was talking about um you know is that how strong is your body so once you've got things like brain fog, so I, I was diagnosed from the testing. I had SIBO, I had uh, heavy metal poisoning, so arsenic and high levels of arsenic and mercury. Uh, I also had mold as well from a previous property that I lived in. So what that does, it depletes your body. So the the whole point behind it was, can I then work out a way of getting through this brain fog. I had no choice, like, because it's not a life to sit there every single day, seven days a week, and then you're searching in the gaps, trying to search on the internet to try something new each, you know, do this for six weeks, do this for two months, do this for three months. So then as I was getting through the training and as the weight started to come down, and because I was measuring those as well, and then I started adding other things in, like TRT. Uh, my testosterone was like 390. It's now around 11, 1150, but I'm under a clinic. So it's at the top end of the range. So that was yeah. one thing. My body's depleted or my T levels are low. And which, when you look at nowadays, the last 30 years, men's testosterone levels are down a huge, huge amount. And obviously when you get to 30, it starts to drop off from there. Depends how well we take care of your body. So I started lifting. I also had my B12 done. And I think the range is something like 200 to 700 from memory. I can't remember exactly. Mine was like 79. And then, and I kid you not, they, the lady turned around and said, I'm surprised you're not dead because it was so low. I mean, it was a joke, but so was the, um so is the levels so i got on to b12 as well but one of the most interesting things and i've got no proof or science to prove it or back it when i'm doing my weighing in for my because i've got a, a trainer as well for lifting and i've got a boxing coach i used to box as a kid uh mainly in the gym but um what would happen is you with the i think they're called impedance um what they're called, impedance uh, weighing machines. So basically they'll tell you about visceral fat and stuff. And they're only guidelines. Yeah. So my visceral fat, I think, was like 22. It's now 9 or 10, my visceral fat. And what I've noticed is as my visceral fat was coming down, the brain fog was starting to clear more and more. And from my understanding, from a non-doctor you know, uh, doctor level, I've got no uh, letters after my name just playing Dr. Google, the, the fact is we're, when you're dealing with visceral fat, um, it's, it's highly, uh, what's the word, inflammable in your body. So you get a lot of inflammation from it. So the more visceral fat you have, 
the more inflammation. So it sets off other issues within the body, talking it in a non-technical terms. But I noticed when that started to come down, it started to clear up until it completely went. So that was one of the things that drove it as well, because I spent years building businesses, not taking care of my health and body or anything else. And then all the other stuff kind of comes into play, you know. Um, so that's it really. But it was one of those things where the switch went off, you'd had enough, and then it was like the last roll of the dice. You're either going to get it sorted or you're not. And then since that was able to clear up, you know, I'm much more productive. I pretty much work seven days a week, but I taper up and down for weekends. I've got my life set up, so I work from home. So it's a lot easier, gym next door recording studio the podcast studio here office front room next door we live in a a little village with like quite nice surroundings which is a lot different from the kid from the council estate you know um, not bad for a setup huh? it's... yeah i mean it's yeah i've had to build it it's taken years i've been, i've done the snakes and ladders of life it's gone up and gone down gone up gone down and uh i think what happened is probably i've went through every possible ways to fuck things up and fail and because i my determination i run out of things to fuck up so where i am in life is because i probably fucked up just about everything and run out of those things so it's kind of swung the other way if that makes sense i mean that's where a lot of guys you know it's like show me somebody who hasn't failed and i'll show you somebody who's never tried you know it's i love that quote because i never really understood it. i always played it safe when i was younger and mm. then all of a sudden i i can remember just thinking no enough's enough i was going to a pub hating it you know I was with friends i didn't enjoy spending time with and i remember just starting the podcast thinking i need something that shows you how to do things and this is when i was like 20 odd and all of a sudden it was just i can't find it i'm gonna make one and this is why I always enjoy finding guys like you who have, you know, who have gone through that journey. I can tell people and show them how they can change, how they can better themselves. But I mean, a lot of guys get to like 40, like I turned 40 this year and mm. they sit there and go, oh, because uh, uh, suddenly they see no friends. They see their wife's, you know, they're not having sex with their wife. Their yeah. kids don't really know them the job they're in, they hate it and stuff like that. Mm. Do you think that's a big issue with because a lot of guys don't know what they want from life, that they suddenly get shaped by their job, they get shaped by their family, they lose their hobbies because they're told what to do. You know, they follow the ringleaders rather than follow their own path. And, it, you know, it's hard for guys to change because they don't even know what they want to change to. Yeah, I mean, you've asked about a dozen questions there. But yes, one I thing I want to <laughs> <laughs> what I would let's pick out these bit by bits and, and break them down. So first things first, right? So what what we need to understand as guys, especially when you start to hit forty, we do not operate on the same biological timeline. So let me just break that down. What I mean by that. So we, if a lady wants to have children. She needs to have a, a work to a safety window of healthy, de uh, like healthy delivery, right? So there's a bit of a timestamp there of once you start going past 35, it becomes much more difficult. We know this because me and my, you know, my wife would lost a son and daughter. So now what's at stake here? We can also argue that women grow up faster and develop faster than men. But on the flip side, you've got a guys generally they want to provide, right? So what happens, they're, they're using their 20s to learn their trade, their craft, and basically they maybe decide they're going to go off and build a business and would have some failures along the way. So you could say, in terms of earning power, all this starts to take shape in their mid-30s and peaks mid-50s. This is going to be the time that you have your most resources, assets, and career on lock. So when you think about it, if you're working off your partner's timeline, you're looking at it as, okay, kids 28, 29, 30, yeah, or before 35. And then hmm. 35 is five years away from 40. But you haven't got your shit together normally if you decided to do this because most people don't have what they want 
until their mid thirties anyway. So a guy might think, oh, okay, well, we've had all the children now, da da da. Now it's time to move into the second half of life. When the reality is, if you've done a lot of work and you've built certain things, you peak thirty five to fifty five. But because you're following the biological timeline of your partner, because that's that's fine, it's not a problem, but you see it that way. And the other side of that as well is years ago, and we're talking about centuries, men used to live to about 40 generally, whether that's through going back really early, if you look at evolutional psychology and biology. Now, they'll get to something like 40. That would be disease, war, lack of medicine, etc. So there might be something that plays in there that you hit a certain age and you go, boom, that's it. Or you realize you're, you're roughly halfway through your life. So then you go, well, what's it all about? What am I going to do next that's going to make a difference to my life? What, what's going to give me a purpose now? Because you may have got the house paid off the mortgage or in a good paying job, and then you're getting bored with the job now. Your kids are starting to grow up. You may not have the same level of intimacy and stuff in the relationship with your partner. So you start to get this dissatisfied. You start to maybe feel like a, I'm a wallet. You know, I turn up, do this, take care of the kids, da da da. And there's the lack of appreciation there. And but all that stuff starts can start to fester. And so then you decide, well, what's next? You know, and then if you've got your peer group disappeared and then you don't go out with all your friends then you're going to start to feel isolated so really it's like how do you build all these factors back in and learn the fact that as i'm 47 and i mentioned up before this call at 30 i thought i was done because i wanted to get to a certain level in the music industry like 30 mm. was old do you understand and then i hit 40 wasn't too bad a couple of things I'm now at 47 and I'm like, how do I extend this run now? Do you know what I mean? I've done a lot of work to get there, but how do I extend the run? So my mindset has changed towards it, not through just being deluded. I know I can't do what I did at 20, at 47, in the gym or whatever, but it doesn't matter. You you work smarter. But I'm excited now. I still get up in in the morning. I've still got energy and I want to get guys to come back and find out what's your purpose. Because if you've got a purpose and the reason to get up in the morning a lot of things can change, but then you have to look around your life and take ruthless accountability. What do I don't like? Am I happy with how I look? Do I feel happy? Am I tired all the time? Am, am I bored? What can I do that's not self-soothing and just sitting in the pub to get over the week until Monday to go back to the job that I don't really want to do? And it's really starting to, first you have to work out what areas you want to prove, what you don't like. Some people will say everything, but you've got to pick one or two of them and then work on those. But we can get into that, into more questions. Because I definitely think that's something that a lot of guys listening you know, would have been nodding their heads that you suddenly, it's it's not like it's an immediate thing. You know, you wake up one day and you start going, I haven't been out in months. I haven't, you know, my, I haven't lost the connection with my partner. The kids see me like as a, as a wallet. I've got no respect in the job and suddenly it's like, what do I do? What do I do now? And we all have like a lot of guys have this belief that 40 is right. That's it. You're screwed. Yeah. You know, you can't go any farther, whatever job you're in, you're screwed, whatever relationship in that's it. You know, if you break any of those, that's it. Your, your career's over, your um, relationships are over, especially if you haven't had the the kids, you haven't had the relationship, If you know, and, I felt that pressure, you know, as a guy mm. coming up to 30, people were like, why are you not dating? Um, or you should be out having kids by now. And you start realizing that your parents are going to die soon. They're getting to that age. I mean, I'm 40 now. I know that I could get married now, you know, say 75 roughly is the kind of, depending on where you're living, you know, there's like a, the ch- eight average age of death. So I could have 35 years with somebody. But in my head, I'm like, I, I must meet them now. I'm, I'm little, And I could feel that sudden. Do you think that's where that midlife crisis comes from? That we suddenly take stock of our life? We actually review? Yeah, I think maybe we'll review and then we become a bit disappointed if we haven't hit the markers that we want. 
right? Mm. And then that feeds into the engine, which is an unfortunately that's a negative feedback loop. And then we can carry on down that path. And and I suppose if you if you think that um it's like a death from a thousand cuts, isn't it? If you get no. chipped away at 365 days a year for 10 years, it's very subtle, it's very insidious, right? But it happens over time and then you stop and you go, right, okay. This has been going on 10 years. What happened? And I think what happens with guys that come out of relationships and they've got no connection, human connection with anyone else. And so they they go and move into a flat. They're trying to pray for two properties or however that's balanced out in the way the divorce works. And then they end up being quite lonely. Um, and one of my goals is to get guys to level up because regardless if you don't stay in the relationship, if you step your game up whilst in the relationship, either it fixes the relationship or it doesn't. And if you don't, the chances are you're going to have options because of the work that you did, you know? Mm. I mean, I, I've had a friend who, it didn't matter what relationship, it didn't matter how long he'd been single for, he mm. would go out, meet the girl, and suddenly he would abandon all, you know, you, you could never get him to come out for a pint, you could never get him mm. to come and do some social. He'd live the relationship, and then when he'd break up, he would suddenly mm. be texting, expecting you to drop everything and come out, you know. It was almost yeah. like he didn't, like he, it was like became like, um, you know, some like it was a symbiotic kind of organism. You know, like they beca- he lived through the relationship. That his identity became the relationship, and that's mm. what I think was terrifying. Was he lost who he was because he only seemed to feel com- fulfilled by being yeah. in that relationship? And I think this is where this whole thing about um, toxic masculinity, but oh, well, then Andrew Tate has become so successful and things like that mm. because people are so lost that they allow a relationship to become their life. But how do we even start distinguishing between what we should have? Like, because we're shaped by our parents, by our upbringing, schooling, cultural beliefs. Yeah. How on earth do we even define what masculinity is to us? Because to be a man, it's great to say, yeah, it's this, this, and this. But there's so many different levels of masculinity, of what people want and things and you know if it's this and if you've a sort of flowing river as your priorities change through life Mm -hmm. and the different seasons of life how do we even define what masculinity is and what makes a good man for you compared to what might be for me compared to johnny down the street you know well i this is this is interesting right because when we look at it you've got to look at masculinity and femininity a social constructs, right? So they vary across the cultures, time periods, uh, whereas male and female refer to biological sexes of human beings, right? So mm-hmm. you can be a man that isn't necessarily, necessarily masculine, and that's all right, right? Okay. Uh, but you are still taking care of your own bullshit and you are a provider, right? So we've gone back to, I remember you were, asked me about um becoming a man you know like you don't become a man when you're 18 right um and and i remember you mentioned this and it's true you don't become a man when you're 18 that's an age right you you go from a boy to a man when you take full accountability for yourself right so you have the ability Mm. and the intention right so you might not you know, you had the ability and or the intention because some people don't always have the ability cash wise to do, you know, taking care of things, but the intent's there. Most men want that. Yeah. You also have an ethical code to do the right thing, even when it's hard. And you also got to look at your decision making and say, does this decision serve me or the greater good? And that doesn't mean self-sacrifice, but it's about trying to make the right decision so going back to what you're saying is so as masculinity is a social construct i'll give you my version right so emotional intelligence and self-awareness right so this is where emotional literacy comes in now you're talking masculine and you go what are you talking about emotions da, da, da. anger is an emotion a lot of good men in prison when they lost their shit you get on top of your emotions 
understand how to control, uh, control and convey them through emotional literacy, right, and emotional intelligence, you won't be in prison. Do you understand where I'm coming from? So Definitely. there's always that mix-up of I'm not saying the guy is roll around the floor crying like a little baby. A woman's going to find that repulsive as well, right? Equally, you're so shut down and you can't process your emotions, including anger, you're going to end up with a life where you're going to be deeply unhappy. So there has to be a middle ground, right? Then you've got respect. All men want respect, yeah? But respect starts with the self, right? And with self-respect and respecting others, this is where boundaries come in. This is the invisible line between two people. You, you go to here, you stop, and then that person starts, right? Honesty, integrity, and being direct in your communications. You know, it's very feminine to be indirect in your communications. But you want to put on empathy and compassion on your words, right? Because it's the way that people feel. So if you think a, load, a lot of women say, I feel like, I feel like, it's because they're talking from a feelings situation. Now, if you're straightforward with your communications and you're really harsh and you hurt their feelings, of course she's going to say you've got small dick energy. You know if she mm. is based on, do you, do you understand? So there's a level of empathy, compassion, etc. Of course, the key one is responsibility and accountability. This is where you hold yourself highly accountable, but you hold people around you. I don't have anyone around me I don't hold accountable. And they can hold me accountable. It's a two-way street. If you can't be held accountable, you're out of the circle. I'm not dealing with people that don't take accountability for themselves, man or woman. Could not care less. Does that make sense? You have to set a time. Mm. Humility. You need to have the ability to admit mistakes and the ability to self-reflect. You've got to look at willingness to learn and grow because if you don't learn and grow and you know that only a fool knows everything. We don't know everything. So there's, there's much to, to what, expand on. Men are logical, right? We're always looking to solve problems. So we go off and find those answers. And so if you've got the willingness to learn, you've got the willingness to grow. Some of this sound a bit woo-woo, right? We're talking masculine here. I'm not talking about getting back on the council state and let's have a tear up. But you need to be able to do that as well to a certain level. Do you understand? Yeah. Um, sorry, go on. Well, I mean, this is where I, because uh, I, I hate the term like masculinity, and you know, like, mm. to me, it should be like I break it down into emo controlling your emotions better, you know, for finding a purpose in your life. Like I used to ask this question: What makes somebody? What is define masculinity? And I, and then I start getting to the point where it's like I've got friends who are both male, uh, you know, like regardless, like, mm. we've all got the same genitalia, etc. And they could maybe scrap every time we go out and get drunk with some random guy who looked across the bar. And then I could have a guy who's a complete nerd, hardly throw a punch, still a man. But they're, you know, if you're not, if you're living to your own values, taking accountability, you know, like uh, dealing with your emotions, things like that. Like to me, we need to reframe masculinity and what actually is the key concepts of a, ma a man. Like you're saying, accountability, controlling your emotions. It's this kind of like twats like Andrew Tate who, you know, come in and say, like, oh, you should treat women like this or you should do this and that. You know, it's if if you haven't got somebody or your own vision of your own life, you're gonna get controlled by others. Be it your relationships, be it like a guru, like a self, you know, and it's I think this is where a lot of guys go wrong, is I want to improve. I'll look at X and I'll try to be like them. But if they don't have, if that's not the role model for them, or they're the guy's a dick in real life or whatever, you know, and they buy the program expecting it to change them, mm. you know, it's, and I think this is a thing, a lot of guys get 40, they get split with their wife and they go and try pick up, which then they create a character of pick, you know, when you're trying to meet somebody. And girls see through that if you're not authentic. Then they try to, they're, you know, they're not working on themselves, so they're not becoming attractive. They're not building a life for themselves, so they're not, you know, so they're not becoming happy. And then you're mm -hmm. rephrasing somebody else's prompts and questions and negs and all that shite. And this is then guys start hating themselves because they're not meeting anybody and they struggle. Mm -hmm. I just like how would you def how would you get guys to start looking at all aspects of their lives 
and saying, you know, because they say what gets measured gets managed. Mm. How do we start going, okay, my relationships are at this, I need to work on that. My physical health, like you were saying, is at this, I need it to be that. You know, you you've met, you trialed everything and then looked back and seen what worked, what didn't. Mm. How does the average Joe doing that, who's sitting in their bed set, who's sitting in their their life crumbling around them, what advice would you get to somebody to start and you know doing some probable analysis of their life? Yeah, I mean, it's tough because once you've been hitting hitting and taken down and you're sitting in the flat and you've lost everything, it's very difficult for people, and I, I admire it, for people that come back. I call it the switch. Once the switch goes off, you go, I've had enough of this. I'm not going to do this anymore. And so, you know, like when you are on low income, and I've been there, I've been broke. I've done it every every step, you know. Uh, and there are things that you can do, and, and the, the, the quickest, and it's not a quick fix, but the lowest hanging fruit is take care of your body, right? So let's, let's break it down. Let's just say you've got, you're in a flat, you're on your own. You haven't got a huge amount of money, but you've got time. You can sit there and you can get four cans of Stella at night and drink those, watch Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. Or if you can't afford to buy weights, and I've got like a gym now, but my gym was my garage, which started as a floor, cheap floor to ceiling punch bag. I need... I added equipment, but mm. a quick fix for you, which I did in COVID. It's not that I couldn't afford to buy the weights. It's just everyone bought all the weights. So when I, I started, I was like, yeah, and, and mm. you couldn't get a hold of weights anywhere, right? Because it's sold out everywhere because they've, with everyone being at home, they go, oh, okay, I'm going to start getting healthy. Do you remember that? Everyone went on the health kick. Definitely. So by the time that October come around, I went to buy some weights. I couldn't get anything. It's going to take weeks for delivery. So what I did is went on, on to Gumtree. So in the US, you're going to have Craigslist, et cetera. Go into Gumtree, go to uh, the clearance section, or look on there for rusty weights, right? Just some dumbbells and barbells and stuff. Most people want to get rid of that stuff. One, it's rusty. Two, they buy the equipment and never get around to use it. It's no good if it's plastic, but, you know, we're talking metal plates, metal bars. Pick the stuff up, take it home, go on to Amazon, Get the rust remover, just soak it. Wire brush, brush it all off, get all the rust off it. Then buy a metal spray, yeah? Put down some cardboard. You've got brand new weights. So suddenly for a 50 to 80 quid maybe, by the time you bought the rust remover, you've got a, a, a little mini gym set up. If you can't afford that, go onto Amazon and get yourself a pull-up bar for fourteen ninety nine that fits in the architrave of one of your doors in a flat. Yeah, go on and then go get... in and do do start off, do one pull-up, because a lot of people can't do pull-ups. I mean, when I started, I used to do um, the pull-ups where basically just in the downwards motion. I was so unfit, I couldn't even do one pull-up. And now I do about, I do them in sets now, because we're, we're in monster sets when we're training with a PT. But then I can do like 10 on each set. Now, even though I'm doing four sets of those with four other ex four or five other exercises, but I couldn't do one. But the good thing was that you could set a task for 30 days. You do one one day, two the next, three the next, then you're going to hit a curve and you might only get three out the next. And then you can build it up and build it up and build it up and build it up. If you can't afford 1499 for that, then do some bodyweight exercises. You can do push-ups, etc., do sit-ups, crunches. Uh, star jumps, all of those kind of things. Let's get to food. And I've done it. I'm on the cut at the moment and fucking horrible. Chicken and broccoli. It's cheap as chips, plenty of protein in there, you know. And when you look at um, microwave meals versus 250 grams of chicken and some frozen broccoli, I know it's not going to be great eating that four, four or six times a day. But it really does drop the weight, honestly, if you can bear it. You get sick of eating all the chicken. Even if you put some uh, gravy granules that's got like five calories in it. So you're soaking the chicken, etc. That's actually cheaper than most ready meals. 
So there's that would be the early cheat. And the reason I say that, so you've got all this time on your hands. What happens is you commit to it. This is, you do two things. You commit into your food. So you've got two disciplines you're working on. You commit to your food and you commit to your training. Your training's next to nothing, right? Because you come home from work if you're working. And if you're only doing one pull-up a day, <laughs> it's not a big commitment, right? Until it starts to become more of a commitment. Then you add more exercise. You start off small. Because what people don't realize, 1% improvement per day compounds to 3,800% because everyone wants to rush fast. So if you can weave in those disciplines, then what happens, the weight starts to come down. People start to notice. You start to feel better. Then the world starts to look a bit better around you. Then you go, oh, what's next? My clothes don't fit properly. All right. But now I'm in shape, right? I'm in better shape. You don't have to have tailored suits and nice watches and all that kind of stuff. You can get away with your 40s. Do you know what I mean? If you're in your 40s, who cares in, in, to a certain level? But you can still be pre presentable and you can go onto Amazon, buy muscle tops or whatever. I'm saying muscle tops, but, you know, fitted tops, yeah? A tenner, mm -hmm. 12 quid, 13 quid. Do you see where I'm going? It doesn't have to be um, expensive and you can do this over over periods. And then what happens? The world starts to feedback because then people will go, you're looking good. And you go, oh, thank you. You've got a bit of admiration there, right? What people don't realize, and I went through it as well through losing a load of weight and et cetera, doing the training, massive changes people's behavior towards me whether that's very unmarried i've been with my 28 years but obviously i speak at events and all that kind of stuff people communicate differently men are more respectful women you know will come and chat to you and da 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 even to the point of squeezing your arms and that crossing the boundary i'll laugh it off but you see where i'm going yep. and you you won't know any of this because what blew my mind about all this was you're getting more female attraction. Not that they're all making a pass at you. This, this, not get it twisted. But there, it seems like fucking hell. This, like I'm forty odd years old. What's going on here? Because when I was in the music industry and I'm in my early twenties and I'm DJing, that made more sense, right? Status or whatever. You're up DJing, people enjoying themselves, they're partying, etc. But then you, it's kind of weird to see that level of female attraction and what guys don't forget about or don't realize is that it goes back to that point of you got say between 35 and 55 to really make things work for you but because you always thought about the other biological timeline if you've been with a partner and you're working with with that time zone of the safety area of having children you don't realize is that I, i've got guys around me that's like i don't have a men plus 40 program but I help a lot of men around me. One of my guys is flying, right? He's in therapy. He's dealt with his codependency stuff. He's been run through the ringer, right? And now he has lots of women asking him out. But he's done the work. He's in tremendous shape. Do you, do you see what I mean? And mm. guys listening now, they go, yeah, but I don't think I can do it. You can. You can. And it's the early feedback that's really helpful as well. You, you walk into work or you go into the building site, you go into the office, clothes fit a bit better. You're looking good. Your confidence is up. How you walk along, you know, not putting your chest out or anything, but how you present yourself, right? You, people can see your confidence. I think uh, Jocko Willink was talking about this on the podcast. I'm going to paraphrase here. He said, like, you know, when... When people, predators, meaning guys where they're going to mug people or whatever, they're looking for people like kind of hunched over, lacking confidence and stuff like that. That Because it's yep. the predator-prey thing. As awful as it is, you don't want to be the prey, right? So they, there's two sides. You're either going to leave you alone, right? Because they're going, I'm going to fuck around with you. And he, it looks like he can take care of himself. Do you know what I mean? That puts a boundary in place. Obviously, you get idiots down the pub who wants to fight everyone and anyone. Go, oh, look at him. You know, he's got a muscle top on or he's got fitted clothes on. Who the fuck does he? You get all that nonsense as well. And that's, you just walk away. But you really start to see the feedback. You don't see it in the early days until really, you know, give it six to eight months. 
And once you've got your food right and you've got your exercise right, you go, right, I'm not tired all the time. I've got plenty of time. On what do I do now? Do you know what? Do a bit of training. I'm going to start a business or really like the idea of that i'm gonna do do you understand and and the best way to get started on a small business is find something you enjoy doing let's say you um you may be good at writing so you might go on to a website and do some copywriting and now with chat gbt and stuff out there at the moment there's so much things that you can do it's just trying to design what would you want to do next so this is why i say baby steps you don't have to do it all at once but that discipline of training every day, that discipline of eating right, then you see the the, the rewards later. Because you don't train, look in the mirror. You go in the mirror and you go, fuck all. Next week, fuck all. Week after next, fuck all. Week after next, week after next, week after nothing. Then month three, you're going, wow, weight's coming down. You know, love handles are coming off a bit. Chest is shaping a little bit. Get to six months. Right, muscle seems to be defining. I can see a little vein here. Do you understand? And then you get to that point where the, that feedback there, your body feedback to the work that you're putting in raises your confidence. But you remember, we just started with one pull-up, a little bit of chicken and broccoli. Do you see where I'm going here? Yeah. Don't no, focus I'm, on the end goal. Like I'm a massive component of that. You know, I always yeah. like I want my tagline to be 1% better in an area yeah. of your life every day because – as you start like looking at your life and you know like gauging my relationships my whatever you know my health my work etc people see where they're like they're losing their energy leaks and they go right i'm going to do this this and this and they come out with 50 different things they're going to do in each area and yeah. then they give up after three days because they're taking on far too much they're tired after the first workout because they've gone balls to the wall then they come back and go Oh, I'm just gonna have a cheap meal because I'm gonna out for a pint. So they lose it. They have no willpower because they've not made subtle changes. You know, like you're saying, like one percent, one percent. And that's yeah. what I say to anybody: is start small. You know, start with a body weight thing. Um, you know, I mean, I've done that pull up thing. Of I do a pull up every time I walk through the door. So yeah. when I was cleaning the flat, I've got all right, just a quick pull up. And before you know it, you've done maybe thirty or forty a day. And you know, you're you're not pushing yourself, and you're suddenly like, oh, oh, you know, if you, I can't afford weights do some press-ups there's always mm. something you can start doing i mean this like i probably should say this is for advice for everybody who's over 40 yeah this isn't just for guys who've had a divorce or something yeah um, no exactly yeah because I, I think i mentioned you know people who have hit rock bottom a few times but i always say to them it's like you know you define what you want in life you pick your goals and stuff but you can start improving them I and this is why i'm surprised you haven't got a program because i know mm. your stuff helps people you know, you said we should always be looking to raise our values a man. So regardless of what situation they are, how do we start mm. raising our value? How do we not look at 40 as a doomsday scenario, but instead look at it as this is the season in your life where you have the most resources, and this is the season where I can truly become who I'm meant to be as a man and look at it as yeah. a positive thing? Yeah, so... Raising your value, there, there's a lot to break out there. When I say raising your value, first you've got to start asking yourself the questions, right? You know, we hear this term, what do, I, what do you bring to the table? Ignore all that. The point of raising your value is if we look the difference between, you know, they'll say, you know, men are love on condition, women, children, pets are, are loved unconditionally, etc. So what a guy brings to the table is they do something of any kind, right? So they create their value by doing things, whether that's a good job, you know, it's a status thing, it's the car, you know, there's all of these elements. They've got to be kind, compassionate and everything else. But one of our purposes on this earth uh, is to do something of value. So then what 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 are your assets? So you sit down and go, what do I bring to the table to yourself? And people don't always understand, but it's not just how much you earn and the house that you live in, because your house isn't actually an asset if you're living in it. It's a liability because you live in the house. 
right? So the first thing, we all need a roof over our head, right? So you check that box, whether you own it or not. But ultimately, what it comes down to is what value do you bring? Like, so you build resources. Your resources are your network as well. So let's say you've got a network of people in, in business and you know you can make a phone call and get things taken care of. That's, a va- that's very valuable, right? You have a good job or good business and you earn well enough to take care of a family. That's a resource that has value, right? You've got friends that can rely on you to get stuff done, take care of things and, and vice versa. These are all values, right? It doesn't necessarily always have to be the status thing. Right. Because I know like no one wants to be at the bottom of the food chain in, in society. It's not good for serotonin either. But we've got to look at and take an honest appraisal of ourselves and say, what do we contribute, you know, to ourselves, to your friends, your family and society as a whole? That's where you start with everything, you know, um, I know people talk about high value men, low value men, high value women. Don't worry too much on the player words of the value aspect. Think of it as everything I do, whatever I do, I want to build as many resources as possible. And your resources, again, is your net, you know, your network of people. That's a great resource because they can open doors for stuff and you can open doors for them. So it's really going, sit down and say, what do I have? Like if we talk about fathers who live in the flat, Their value is they're bringing as well is raising their children if they've got children. So what value do they bring? I want to be the best father possible to my children to give them a good structure within society. Yeah. Or you might own a business and you're employing people. You've got that responsibility. You add value to their lives by paying their wages. Yeah. So that they can take care of their families. So you should always be looking to improve yourself rather than go backwards, goes back to my point, 1% every day, 3,800%. But did you know, if you went backwards every day for a year, your value drops by 97%. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're going, if you flip it back and forward. Hmm. I mean, that's something I definitely find with guys. It's like, I'm going to go out and make new friends. I'm going to do this and go out and meet girls and stuff. And I'm just like, before you even start that, you know, look at some like hard, soft and hard and soft skills you can fix. Look at some of like the habits you can fix in your own life, you know, like get better sleep, get better nutrition. You know, it's like there's so much like you were saying earlier, you know, about controlling your emotions that yeah. might make you have a better relationship with your partner because you're not flying oh, off the will. handle at the kids and stuff. You know, like it could be you could become more empathetic towards people that you work with or like the, like for me, say the students I deal with, I could understand them on a deeper level. So I could Mm. actually see where they're coming from to fix the problems. You know, there's so many things you can do, like to become more accountability, you know, like I'm going to mark on the calendar when I'm working out, I'm not going to stand for any excuses. I'm going to do my workout five minute workout a day. I'm going to put an X on the calendar and before you know it, you've done 30 days because you see that chain and you don't want to break the chain marked on the calendar. You know, there's things like how, how, how would you start with somebody to start controlling their emotions to become show accountability in their life, you know, mm-hmm. to get their own life in control before yeah. they start thinking external, do the intrinsic work that needs to be done before we start caring about status and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think first thing you've got to look at is <clears throat> your childhood. Most of the most of your programming will come from your childhood, so you are going to develop from say a you know from zero to eight years old, right? So you're very malleable at that time. So all the influences around you is going to go into your programming. So let's just say that you was raised in a chaotic environment. You may find later in life, you thrive in more chaotic environments. You might find that in order to feel love, there has to be 
chaos. So you might be the savior that wants to go and rescue that person that's got mm -hmm. a lot going on. And then you'll find that you'll disown or dis you'll abandon your own needs for that person. You know, going back to that guy that you mentioned earlier on, as soon as you were talking about that, I'm, first thing I'm thinking is attachment issues and attachment style. Right. So he locks into that person and he lives his life through that person. So what there is is a level of lack of boundaries to a certain degree because he's not individuated. As soon as he gets into a, a, a relationship, it sounds like it's an enmeshment because he abandons himself and goes into the relationship. And the, there's a level of love that he needs that maintains him in the relationship. And when the relationship is over, he's back out, he's on the phone. He's like, how you doing, boys? We, when we come back round again. Because he hasn't fully individuated. He abandoned himself and his needs in that relationship. It's like when you talk about uh, my other half. Well, they're not the other half because you're a whole. Does that make sense? Yeah. Definitely. So you go into relationships as two holes. And in that relationship, both parties have their needs met. It's reciprocity maintains a long-term relationship. Because if there's a disbalance in power in the relationship, one's happy, one's miserable often, or they both end up miserable. So there's sure. a lot to unpick there. Yeah, because when a lot of people it's because the change you know like mm. the, like that guy would go into a relationship and he would become this like this version of himself and girls f f are attracted to you at a certain level they don't want you to change and suddenly become a lap dog or become like following them around lose all your hobbies and stuff you know they want they they're attracted to the person that you are at the time and i think i see a lot of guys suddenly they just give up responsibility to somebody else. They let their boss tell them what to do. They tell the partner, tell them what to do, you know, oh, pick up the kids deal. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Basically, if she turns you into, if you turn yourself, not she, if, if you turn yourself into one of the children, you're going to kill any genuine burning desire. That's mm. when you get dead bedrooms. But going back to your point, we all do it. I've done it. We all do it. And our partners will get complacent pretty much everyone does so all this stuff that you did to win her that all stops all the stuff she did to win you over stops so their marriage goes through phrases like phases yeah so people get bored sometimes in the in the relationship attraction can go sometimes the attraction comes back so if you look at statistics over 50 percent of marriages fail 75 percent of second marriages fail right so Marriage isn't a, a, like a Disney fantasy. Maybe for the first six months when the oxytocin is sky high for both parties, right? You're going at it like rabbits. Uh, but what is with a marriage, it's a constant investment that comes from both parties, right? So hmm. if one only tries in the marriage, then the marriage becomes a zero-sum game and where there's only one winner and the other one becomes a loser, right? And I've learned a lot through this stuff because whilst I don't have any letters after my name, I've had a front row seat to five marriages and divorces, my mum's. I've been with my wife 28 years. We've been married 22. We've lost two children. We've gone broke. Uh, two rounds of marriage, uh, marriage counselling. Separated for a short period on a couple of occasions. And even got to the point where we went down the road of divorce and legalities and looking at a mediation, right? So marriage, you know, is hard. And unless there's intimacy, reciprocity, respect and boundaries, it's never going to be fulfilling. And like two of the biggest curses of marriages is that pent up resentment, right? And often lack of money. So resentment is built up over the years. You see the couples like, you did this, you did that, and, and they backsnap at each other. It's constant, like, dig away, dig away, dig away. Have you seen it, haven't you? have gone out with friends and you watch watched oh, that yeah. unfold. That is toxic. That is so damaging. I actually remember when I was at um, marriage counselling, first round, 2015, we did it twice. And I was saying that I 
you know, this is my wife. I love her. I don't want all this. You know, you did this and bring that up from the past and you did this. And I want that to stop. And the lady turned around and said to me, but that's normal in long-term relationships. And I said, if that's normal and that's marriage, fuck marriage, you can have it back. Because I won't do that. I'm not going to sit there and pick away at my wife at her self-esteem. And I'm not going to put up with it either the other way. Just because it happens in marriage and you're a marriage counsellor, you think that's good. What's good about digging and poking away at someone that you love? It's terrible. Do you know what I mean? And we don't, to oh, this definitely. day, we've had like things that will go up and down and things, but generally that's our combined rule between us. Like that doesn't happen. Like I, I, I'm, I'm not going down that path. Do you know what I mean? Because I don't want to do that to the the woman that I love, yeah. who birthed my children. Do you know what I mean? But you see that, don't you? It's like guys who suddenly treat a partner like shit, and you're thinking there was obviously a spark, an attraction that led you together. And you know, like the the. I don't like the terminology, but you should treat your partner like a queen. It should be somebody that you want to wake up to and you want to do things. I mean, I don't know if you know how unique you are because to, for somebody to go through that level of grief, to go through that problem, but to be open and vulnerable about it and to actually then help guys with that, that's, that's so unique in today's society where we're taught you have to be tough. You have to solve your own shit. And, you know, you have, then you get guys who are telling everybody, go and pick up women, they're garbage, you know, and then suddenly other guys are going, no, you can be like this. And we need more guys like you who are saying, and especially people who are maybe at a low ebb in life, especially yeah. 40s where there's a lot of guys committing suicide. You yeah, know, that terrifies me. I want to normalize sorting out your bullshit. I want you to go and do in the child work. I want you to do all those things. Fuck what the boys say. Fuck the brotherhood. If they tell you, go and do this course. Don't go to get your CPTSD sorted and your flashbacks and your childhood trauma and the problem because you can't function in society. Your brothers are there to support you and with positive masculinity. They take care of your friend. I agree that you can't sit there and wail and roll around the floor crying in front of your partner all the time. Get that. There's a time and a place to be vulnerable. Yeah. There's a time and a place to understand emotional literacy. And it doesn't make you weak to sort your own bullshit out. Oh, definitely not. I mean, it, it doesn't. And that's the problem we have, right? Because there's a lot of guys running around, you know, who are promoting masculinity, never had a fight in their life. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't run around. I'm 200 pounds. I can fight, yeah? I've been fighting since I was a kid on the council estate. But it doesn't mean I'm going to go around and bully people. What I do is I don't put up with that shit from anyone, right? because I believe people hold down their own power. But if you bully or pick on anyone around me, including women, you'll get to see the side of me that you don't want to see. But I'm cool, I'm calm and collected. Men need to have teeth as well. But I don't like bullies, and I don't like men being disrespectful to women either. Yeah. And I think that's a big problem now is people think, oh, to become a man, I've got to rule with an iron fist i've got to be seen as the, dot, the alpha you know and it's like i want to beat up whoever said alpha first you have to be an alpha male because even in wolves it's not really true you know and, and and that's what i find so irritating it's like it's such a sign of strength to go to somebody and say I feel suicidal i have or depressed or i need this or to go and say to your wife can we talk to somebody? We were having issues. Yeah. And, you know, and then she's probably feeling the exact same way. And like, oh, brilliant. Or, you know, and I, or you want to step aside and say, I want a better connection with my kids. So I'm going to go do mm. stuff for them. I want to be a bit more accountable in my life. These are amazing things to do. And a lot of these small things can have such a, like you were saying, a compound interest into mm. what you do in life. And I mean, I did jujitsu, um, currently training, blue belt. You know, the, and you're taught basic things where you can strangle out the majority of people, control the majority of people, but you start feeling this inner confidence, the self belief. You never mm. want to use it, but you know it's there if you need it. I mean, I know it's you're there. a big fan. It, 
Yeah, like, exactly. It's there to use for the right time and not your ego. It's not there for you to flex your ego because, sorry, I cut you off there. I was going to talk about, about boxing in a minute, which is what's amazing about boxing. And I, I want every child, boy, man, I don't care, get in the boxing ring. Not necessarily the ring, but go to the boxing club. We talk about role models for masculinity. Are there going to be dicks out there? Of course. But you can learn so much about yourself and life by going to the boxing gym. So let's say you're, you're kids, right? You're young. Two types of people go to the boxing gym, generally. Or three. People want to stay out of trouble. Kids are getting bullied or the bully. Yeah, so let's break it down. You've got the bully and the bullied. So the bully walks into the gym. That bully will get his ass handed to him and he's going to run right and run away and cry look like a little baby or it makes him a better man. The guy that used to get beaten up will learn to protect himself and will not tolerate any bullshit from anyone. Why? Because he carries himself better. He's still calm. He doesn't plan to use any of it, but he's confident. And so when the bully's in the playground and the school, I know everyone's doing it all on WhatsApp now, they look him in the eye. Because men can see, when you look a man in the eye, you know where that man's been. And they don't want it. They don't want that smoke. Do you see what I mean? And it's the same with kids as well. Um, so by going to the gym, what, what can you learn? You can learn positive masculinity. You're going to have a, a coach, generally, the coach is there, an amazing man, right? They're going to, help you get to reach and push your limited limits. They'll pull you back if you're drowning. So they may not put you in for sparring, and etc. but they're going to help you define yourself and confidence. It'll teach you about honor. It teach you your limits. It teach you to know where your place is. All men need to be checked. All men need to be put in their place. Some point when they get above their stations, when you look at most boxers, they'll tell you it saved my life. It's very much a working class sport. It's saved people's lives. It's helped with mental health. It's helped with masculinity by being around positive people. The bullies that normally come out of there actually restructure themselves. The guys that were getting you know, in trouble with police and stuff like that because they were bored on the council estate are too focused on their tra training now. They're enjoying the training. They know the difference between the two and they go, I can get out here. They build discipline. They're taking care of their body. They're taking care of their mind. This all feeds into mental health. There's so many positive things that come out of that. And 99%, 97% say of boxers will never have a street fight because they know how dangerous it will be if they did for the Definitely. other person. Yeah. For the other person. Do you understand? Because 80% of the planet can't fight. And you also have that la lack of ego, you know, because you know you can take care of yourself. So you think. Yeah. Yeah. You're more likely to go, look, like, mate leave it you know and i think that's the, a big thing here is it's like how many guys are listening going but oh these are friends i've had for life and it's like yeah go get, get some better friends go to meet up yeah. groups take up a sport where you're taught self-respect but yeah it's almost like self-love for yourself you understand that you don't need to scrap to prove you're a tough guy you don't need to go and start a fight because that's the masculine thing to you know like that guy i was talking about earlier he used to, I remember him saying, or somebody bitched about him on Facebook, and he goes, oh, you need to come back to them because it shows you, you know, that you're, like, in control. You know, like, you, it's yeah. a dominant you thing. You know what you do? Thought, you block them. Move on. Uh, and Morons. I just thought, why would you waste your energy yeah. rather than doing that than sitting there going, oh, fuck off, like, you know, grow up. And there's, like, I always say to guys, create, not consume. You know, go out and Take up a pottery class. Go and do something that you want to do. Look at some. Mm. Look at your life. What did you want to do as a kid? Oh, I want to learn to cook. Go and cook. You'll meet people there who have the same interests in you, who will become friends. You know, and like I say, jujitsu for for me, it changed my life. Met friends that, that you know would have never met before. Um, same way you were boxing. People who are in trouble, it gives them a focus. And, you know, if you want to go to the gym, fine. If you want to go to boxing, fine. If you want to do, I don't know, volleyball or something, do what makes you happy. And then you start getting that self-respect and it's the way you hold yourself. And then you show, you find that spark again that I think a lot of guys lose at 40. 
and then you start thinking girls notice it or your wife notices it your kids mm. notice it you know and it's like you start building a connection and it's little by little you you start speaking to people and like i find that with this like people go how can you talk to people for an hour easy you are interested in them but i get so much from this because they light a spark of me in something else and then that leads into another thing that leads to another thing and you know it's 40 isn't anywhere close to death but it's i think that's when you realize you were finite you know you I can't I don't even know how to pronounce the word properly. But you know, you get to that point where you realize it's like you're not infallible and you know it's you're on the second leg, right? Yeah. Regardless if we have an advancement in technology, you might get a squeeze out of an extra fifteen years, right? Through new technology. I'm forty seven. Ten years time, there might be something that prolong prolongs life to mm. a certain age, right? So we now know that everything we do really matters. And do you know what? Your your most precious thing isn't money, isn't your house, isn't your car, isn't your watch. It's your time. Definitely. It's learning to use your time right. And who you give your time and attention to. You value your time. There is a... It's time for a quick break. There are millions of potential products to buy, so how do you know which ones are worth your hard-earned money? Simple. You go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and explore those that will transform and improve your life. You'll find deals, listener exclusives, and special offers with some great companies. Recommendations are 100% honest and only on items Ian has tried or believes in. The companies showcased will make you a better man in all areas of your life. Simply go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and level up. There was, um, was it Rob Kelly? I think it was Rob Ke- Dr. Rob Kelly, and he was saying, I can look at you and the five people you hang uh, You know, they say you're the average of the five people you hang mm. around with. And he was saying, I can look at you and your friends, and I'm, just by your friends, I know the level of belief you have in yourself. I know the level of where, what you're going to achieve. You know, like so it's like, you know, you've got a million dollar mind, but a lot of guys have two cent friends. And he said, why yeah. not just, why not get rid of them and find guys that you actually want to hang around with who like, there's a lot of guys who come in and give you a hug and, you know, like, oh, let's go do this. Or, you know, are you okay? You're a bit down and, you know, let's go to the gym. Let's, you know, they want to see you succeed. They want to push you up. Why, why waste time? Like We've only got such a small amount of time in this world to make a difference. Create, you know, give something back, volunteer, go and do a new hobby. Rather than sit at 80, and I mean, I've had a lot of regret in my life, it's one of the worst feelings in the world. You never want to get to a point where you're on your deathbed and go, fuck. You know, like, get a bucket list. I want to go to see Paris. Fine, go do it. There's ways to do it if you've got low finances. Oh, I want to get in shape. Now is a 40 plus, perfect time to go do it. I want to have a better relationship with my kids. Brilliant. You know, pick what you want in life, not what other people. And that spark is hell of attractive, but it's also hell of good for self-love, for accepting yeah. yourself. You know, what do you find for guys who come to you and say, I did X, I, you know, I stabbed somebody, I did mm. whatever, like really, you know, stuff that's maybe not societal accepted and they yeah. want to start again. You know, st- second chances, especially for guys who've come out of prison or, you know, um, one of the guys I interviewed, he was like how we're treated as a number in prison. Mm. Like, um, so he said when he came out, suddenly getting out of that mindset, you know, you're not a number, you're a person. And he said, just having somebody write a CV for guys in prison, mm. they suddenly realized that they are valued, that somebody does care, and it changed yeah. their whole outlook. How do we start getting guys who need a second chance to, you know, to stop looking at the past, stop fantasizing about the future, but live in the present to improve themselves and actually make the 40s that turning point? Well, one of my friends from school went away for armed robbery and he's gone back into doing music, doing drum and bass. I haven't seen him for a while. 
Um, but he went down the, I mean, look, I was, I, I got off the council state because I was either going to be in dead in prison like half my mates, right? Mm. So I would say anything is a win. Like I won at life because I would have been a statistic, as you would expect, left school, could read and write properly, yeah? On a council state, been arrested, car stereos, all that kind of stuff. Then got into the rave scene and like shitty jobs, all of these different things. I've never been to prison, which I'm pleased about, but there are good men in prison and people can reform. Mm-hmm. but it's harder when they've got a criminal record to get to next level i don't know enough about the area of post release i know there's not a great support mechanism but i would definitely say look go and do some therapy work go and learn about emotional literacy go and do work around your behaviors because if you think you're in prison you're always watching your back okay prison life's going to be tough your cortisol is going to be high. So you might spend all your time in flight mode all the time. Yeah. And then what you're going to be is you're going to be like hypersensitive to your surroundings. So I would definitely start with add or get peace of mind. Well, then go through a framework where whether it's through, um, through therapy and work through all the stuff that you can start to heal on those areas because you're going to need to heal first before you get in the job. You want to get out of your environment, yeah? You don't want to go back to your old environment where it picks up the bad habits, yeah? No one can heal Mm. in a toxic environment. Whether that's in prison, back on the estate, or whatever, you want to need a clean break and don't go back. So they're going to be key things. Then the tricky one is, well, it's hard to normally, you know, depend on your record. And I don't know where that stands, um, because I don't know enough about the company's house, whether you can own a business but you could get back into owning the business. You know, let's be honest. Some of the people that the, some of the people on, on the street that are doing, dealing gear and stuff, they know their numbers or they couldn't do what they do. Right. So they've got that kind of hustler's mind. So then how do we get them to take that hustler's mindset and put it onto a legal business that they can own and it's theirs and they feel they can take pride in that, you know? It's a tough one, but I think first you get your mind right. First you accept it doesn't matter what people think because it's your life you've got to live in your shoes. You know, it's okay for you guys to turn around and say, no, just get to the gym, you know, and it's, the gym's not going to be enough. A gym doesn't fix your CPTSD. It doesn't fix your attachment styles. It doesn't fix rumination and all those different things of if you go and reflect on your life. So definitely I would look at that area first is like, where do you want to prove? Do you have anger problems? Cool. Go online, download some worksheets, go and do some emotional literacy, understand how that works, why you feel like that. Yeah. Cause a lot of people will put off by it because they're going, I can't do that. I'm a masculine guy, but then they'll sit there with riddled with CPTSD, live in a miserable life and not be able to operate properly in society. So we have to normalize that part for sure. But post that, I'm not sure where it stands but a lot of these guys hustlers will make good businessmen if they use their integrity but the hustlers mentality of the grind of doing the work does that make sense so a translation of skills but in a positive sense because i mean i've had depression i've had to take tablets for it i've had seasonal affliction disorder um which probably was the same thing with the depression you know, like since the dark nights come in, I can go a bit kind of down in the dumps. But I know that, so I work on it. Um, I've had, classified with OCD, like obsessive compulsive disorder. And it's like, yeah, great. So I know what my triggers are and I work on it. So when I see somebody who comes and starts throwing punches, there's usually something you can see behind that. You know, you know like you're saying, you know that there's a a pinpoint a reason that fuels that maybe it's self-hatred it's an inner critic and that's why i say to guys it's like if you can't if you don't want to see speak to somebody look at cognitive behavior therapy look at neuro-linguistic programming if you can't afford it google it there's free worksheets like you're saying yeah but there's all go and buy i get a free library card and you can buy books uh, you can get books rented on it you can get dvds Mm. on it and it'll be things like you know like what's your trigger points okay well this is why this is happening you know you're maybe 
like you know, say the big thing everybody thinks of OCD is like hand washing because of the contamination, and it teaches you about exposure therapy. You know, there's ways you can go and treat your like mental health stuff, and like we we're saying yeah. earlier, it's not a weakness; it's a massive sign to go. I'm I'm fed up of this. I don't want to regulate with drinking drugs anymore. I want yeah. to go and learn how to fix this and deal with it. But how have you seen mental health change in the last ten to twenty years? You know, like a huge amount. It's like what what concerns me the most, right? I've been through a lot of stuff. You've been through a lot of stuff. People have had incredibly tougher than you and I, right? So we're blessed. I, mm. I, I, I always look on that side of things. No matter what's gone on, losing two children, all those kind of things, there is always someone who's going to be worse off, right? So when we look at the last 10, 20, maybe 30 years, and we look at the rise in self-deletion of men, I'm looking at it and going, well, hold on a minute. My granddad, we went to war, took a shell, come home alive to his family, broke his back, you know, hard work, working on the docks after. And what he went through as an example, and they never had any of that support. But now we're smothered in support. It's everywhere. If you reach and go online, there's always, whether that's a YouTube video to help you with mental health fortress, whatever, if you do a search, right? There's so much available. We live in the safest times on record that's ever been recorded. The problem is because the world's fully connected now, the news only wants to give you the bad stuff. Yeah. Because our news isn't filled with all the good stuff. It's all the negative stuff, which gets perpetuated. So we get the impression that we've got, we're got we living in a you know tough times. we we are, you know, there's a recession kind of kicking in and people are struggling. I'm not denying that whatsoever. But we, as men, we've got to realise is that we have gone soft. We've got too much convenience. We've had too much protection. We've had too much of when we're younger. depends on your childhood, right? It's going to differ. But you may have been raised where you come six in the egg and spoon race and you got a trophy. You may have been like where you didn't ever have to do a job you didn't want to do. You may have been like you got cold so you didn't go to school. You might have been like your mum still makes your lunch until you're 15, 16 years old. And the, all of those things play into those patterns. Yeah. yeah. And I think what sets men up is they require a series of challenges to get over those challenges to feel a sense of reward for getting over those challenges. And then more challenges come and more, and it toughens them and toughens them, and tough, but they've got to be built into it, right? So what concerns me is we've got all this mental health care. We're getting more and more and more and more and more of it, yet the numbers are going up. I mean, how do we regulate that? I have no idea. But mm. I think a lot of it comes down to, which is right, you know, I've got no letters after my name. A lot of mental health care is very tippy-tappy, you know, very light touch, very this. And on the flip side, people like me and, and other people may need, listen, mate, sort your fucking life out. Let's get you in there. Don't worry about what everyone thinks. Who cares what the alphas and it, fuck them. Get yourself sorted. I'm letting you know it's cool. It's fine. Maybe it's that voice that does that reaches the kids on the council state. Do you understand? Because yeah, not right. everyone's the same. Not everyone can be communi communicated the same. So my concern is why are the numbers going up. And it's easy to go and blame and point things. I don't know why the numbers are going up when we've got all this care. I think it's just not the, the, the it's not landing. It doesn't hit and resonate with certain types of people. Do you understand? Yeah. And I think maybe that's where it is as well. And the fact that we've got mobile phones, we can order food on everything's so convenient now. No, no, and no. maybe also because everyone talks about mental health, everyone then runs to the default now. Yes, my mental health. I'm going for my healing. You know, and there's mm. that side of maybe they don't, there are some people that don't have it as bad as other people, but it's easier to go, oh, it's my mental health. Do you know what I mean? Like a cop-out. But, but there's people that really have problems with mental health. But you can't diagnose that because you can't 
tell that and say that to people is very disrespectful, right? But there's going to be people that will also have a victim mentality against the ones that really need the help and they're doing it for attention. Who knows? I can't give you the full answer. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that's something I was want to go into is like, when I started it, I went there and the first, like our current healing modality for that is, here, take some antidepressants. And you're like, yeah. mm, okay. So I tried that and I was sitting there, okay. I would try talk therapy and I found I was just talking it up in my head. I wasn't actually dealing with it. But the second I took personal responsibility and said, I I'm going to change this. I'm going to get a yeah. new job or I'm going to move to a new city, which is completely like the first time I feel like I've had a life in a city. Yeah. And that was like, um, I think it's like, yes, these things are great, but we need to mm. say to guys as well, yes, but you need to make a change. You you can't let other people dictate it and control it. That's again, mm. giving your, I don't like the phrase, but giving the power away. You need to yeah. say, okay, this is what I want from life. I'm going to use these as a tool to help me get better and to keep me focused. I mean, back in the day, you were called thick if you had dyslexia. You know, it was just accepted. Nowadays, I was called okay, thick at school. Uh, I was thick, yeah. And now people go, oh, he's got dyslexia. Oh, cool. Mm. So there's fantastic advances there. But now we've gone too far the other way. And I've got a friend who works in a school. She said before in the day you would have maybe one, mm. two kids in the entire school who would need extra support, who would have, mm. like, these support workers. Now there's something like 80-odd percent in some schools who have all got ADHD, who have got such and such a syndrome where you, you would say, is it, or is it because they've never had to take responsibility? And mm. it's a, it's a dangerous topic to go into because you, it is, you try yeah. not to avoid have to anybody. Respect. Yeah. Yeah. Like my, my goal is to get people to take care of themselves and deal with whatever they need to deal with. And you have to, healing is a self road that no one can do for you. You have to do the work yourself. And once you take ownership and then you do the work, you come out the other end and your life gets better. I, I mean, it's the best that, thing I that's ever what did. It is. But some people, you have to find a way of communicating. So go back to, I know that you mentioned Andrew Tate, you know, on, on one side, forgetting all the other stuff he talks about. He has on a mental health level got to, regardless of what you said on one side, there are elements where, because of his communications, he's literally gone to people, get in the gym, sort yourself, and people have. not So we, we skip all the, what he says on the other side. Yeah. But there is elements in there that, in his message, that actually work into a certain group of people that are getting in the gym. He, he found a way to communicate that. But I think what he's, what he's said with other stuff is where he's going to be held accountable for that kind of thing right so some people this is the thing that some people will only resonate with certain types of people like when i talk about mental health maybe someone who um maybe say like a upper class family you know probably i would not re resonate do you see what i mean but the kid on the council state or a guy my age who's who's you know been on the council state, lived in the council house and stuff like that, might be able to resonate with me because I've turned around and said, look, fuck it, don't worry about it, get your shit sorted. And then it's like, oh, okay. It isn't, do you understand? The, so, the, there's nuances there and it's going to take everyone to do their bit. Because I, I, mean, I, I remember when I had really bad depression, I can remember not going outside for a couple, you know, because I could work, I could do like a weekend, I would come home on a Friday night and I would barely go out, out the flat again till Sunday. I would buy what I needed because I was, at the time, I was living in a place I hated. I was terrified of, like, going into college and stuff like that. Because I would go in and do the classes and go, go home. And I yeah. regret that because at the time, I never had that life. But I also then had the time when I went on depression, they gave me um, antidepressants. And I can remember sitting there, and after that initial wave of feeling good, you sit there and go, what now? You realize you need to then step up. And then I needed to make that step to change it. And that changed my life. And that's why I'll say to people, it's like, use these things. Have a great time, you know, like, go in and speak to somebody and all that. But don't just sit and think about it. Go and deal with it. 
and you have that like that personal accountability and suddenly that one change here you know tidy up your house a bit okay cool okay maybe speak to that cashier if you've got a bit of social anxiety you know mm. just like oh, how's, how's your day going All right you don't need to have a thing and i always say people have like and treat everybody the same ceo janitor mm. cashier whatever does not matter you know and it changes their day they put a smile on their face and that knock-on effect and it doesn't need to be anything big and before you know it you're suddenly getting the confidence i'm going to go approach that girl i'm going to start a business i wanted to mm. think of what i used to be like and what i'm now like and the job i'm in I mean, earning over 30 odd grand, and I'm like, oh, I would never imagine that. Oh, I would have never imagined I would have bought a flat. Oh, I never imagined mm-hmm. I've done that. You know, I'm not boasting, but these are things that when I look back then, I would, I would have laughed you silly if you had said I would have done these things. But you need to go that first step. But suddenly, I turned 40, felt terrible, and I contemplate going back on the tablets. And then I took them for a couple of weeks. Or, or sorry, a couple of months, and I didn't feel like they were changing anything. And that's mm. when I realized I need to change my life. I need they're they're just hiding the feelings. They're hiding the they're they're masking the the true issue you need to deal with. Yeah. And like you're saying, you need somebody that comes to you and say, "Let's go and do this," you know, like or let's take up boxing. And you don't know what they've transformed their life in six weeks, you know, and it's, it's difficult. We don't have that people. And that's why I'm glad there's people on Instagram and that who are doing it like you, you know, who are giving people these kind of think about it, let it, you know, let your, that message of the video sink in. Okay, cool. And then before they know what they're thinking about it and they maybe act a bit different, they treat their, you know, they're maybe go up to their wife and say, let's go for a date night. Let's yeah. you know. Let's do some of the kids rather than go for a pint, mm-hmm. and they go oh, before they know it. Their kid enjoys it, and they have a better connection. And a couple of weeks down yeah. the line, changes their life. You know what? Like, in addition to this, are there health checks you've noticed for guys? You know that are coming up to that thing. What about financial planning? How do you take responsibility, not just for you, for your family, for your life? Do you look at like, you know, I think they said somewhere that the majority of people don't have a male best friend. The majority of yeah. people don't have a pension, have barely have a thousand pounds in savings. There's a yeah, lot of people. Less than five grand in, tra- in savings. Uh, yeah. It's it's terrifying. I mean, I did that when I was younger, but I had parents who kind of pushed that on us, you know, that you need to take responsibility. Yeah. How How do we, like, if you're a guy who's coming into this, you know, they've maybe got a partner, maybe don't. Mm. but they're getting to that age how you know what would you advise people to start doing to plan for their future plan for like their health their cholesterol you know because mm. if you're going to start eating better and go to the gym and stuff mm. like that they they probably should find out if they're okay health-wise but we should also look at how, how are you financially how are you work-wise how are you like for thinking like um i remember my mother she set a file up with all the paperwork for their car, all the stuff for the house. So if anything ever happened, we know it's all in that file. Yeah. And I remember thinking, fuck, because it suddenly hit home that my parents were getting to that age that I could lose them in 10, mm. 20, 30, whatever years. But in your head, how many guys haven't got any plans for the future? They're living day to day, not realizing Mo- this. It's not just guys. Most people don't have a plan for the future. No. Um, I done my will two weeks ago. It's a bit freaky, um, but it's going to be, it will be complex with owning two businesses, you know, and understanding if the business got to be sold on or bought out. All those things had a layer of complexity when my wife and uh, my daughter and being hit with taxes if you, when you sell the business and what's the best structure and then putting someone in charge. I've got two people in charge of my will. Um, that's weird for me to do that because I'm 47 it's like am I putting the mockers on myself but I had to do it as a responsible adult because yeah. it could end up being a mess and um when you don't have a will then and you've got business and you've got partnerships and stuff like that it can become very complex and take forever and the reality is if I'm gone we need to make sure the money's liquid for my family 
because for them, they're not business owners, my, my wife, my daughter, and nor should they have the burden of trying to work all that stuff out. And the reality is, is that they're going to want access to the money to be put away to do with what they want to do with that money if the day were to come. Does that make sense? So you've got to take care of, depending on your age, but you take care of your will. You look at your savings. You look at if you own the business, you look at the value of the assets of the business there. Bring in the financial planner. You know, there's plenty of people who just go online and they'll decide, you know, be careful where you're reinvesting your money. I, I've i got investments through the business as well. My partner is uh, on one of my – I've got an agency. We've got a technology company that looks after – pay-per-click advertising for for brands on Amazon. We build all our own technology, but we've started to invest a lot of reinvested profits from the business into the markets. Whereas I let him get on with that. It's not my world. I invest in people. But it depends on what your flavor is and what you want to do. You want to be looking at speaking to different financial planners, look at their financial instruments and make sure that they're not bending you over and there's all these different fees and you walk away with nothing. Yeah, so... Mm. Do some research on on the market. Think about if the value of leveraging any properties that you own, you know, um, as your assets, not the ones that you live in them, and just try and set something up for the future. But unfortunately, you know, I think in the UK there's maybe 12%, 13% are earning six figures and above of the country, right? Um, So a lot of people are living on a tighter income and i think we are now in that world where it's just pure consumerism we've got so much credit and debt out there and we're encouraged to spend 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 and money just gets printed endlessly right and i think as a whole we have to take responsibility of that as well you know it's one thing to have some savings and the investments, but then you got to look at your debt, and you don't want to be leveraged in a load of debt. But we're encouraged in that. You know, we go go to college, get in the debt, then go and get a good job. We're not telling people skip college, and and we're not saying to the school teach more people to become entrepreneurs, to create more jobs, to create more people that can be self-contained themselves. Look at, you know, situations with COVID where people were either furloughed, they were laid off or, you know, the, you know, guys working on the building site. Some of them are just out there working through COVID, risking their lives, you know. And it's like, can we get to the stage where we can encourage people, more and more people to start their own businesses, to have the hold over their finances so they're not going to get a payment from a third party company where, you know, the days are gone of getting a carriage clock and a watch or whatever at the end when you're 60. You know, like you can do as much time there as possible. But they're going to replace you at some point. So I want to encourage more men and women to start their own businesses. My 17-year-old daughter is a grafter. She's just saved three grand up to buy a car. Awesome. Bought it the other day. 17 years old. And I'm like, I need to get you to understand financial literacy because you're selling your time at the moment. You need to not be selling your time, which is a day job, yeah? And I said, you can make all the mistakes you want in the world because you've got the safety net of us. What most people do is they get sick of their job and then they decide to start a business when they're leveraged with responsibilities. And I'm like, by 25, you could be doing what you want to do. You'll fail a few times, but you're not paying the rent or anything. This is perfect. And I also wanted to know, because wherever I do leave, as we see, the second generation, third generation, blow it all, right? So I need her to understand the value of money as well. And if I can get her to understand and she wants to do it, you know, not everyone wants to be an entrepreneur or a business owner, she means she'll respect whatever I leave behind for the next generation. You know, I want to break that generation. We're from East London. No one's had a pot to piss in and a window to throw it out of. I'd like to think that my child, you know, my children's grandchildren will be okay to a certain level, mm. you know? I mean, that's why I'll say people, it's like, you're just like your dad isn't always a compliment. You know, it's like, <laughs> look at it as a sort <laughs> my dad, of three. My dad was an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look at it as like I'll a three-pound tax. Like my dad is like very 
shy emotionally, you know, um, right. hard worker, very graphs and all that, but because his dad wasn't very good. And I don't know if you've seen those like pictures where it's like the kid, the granddad shouting at the dad, you're worthless. And then the dad shouts at the kid. And then that kid says to his kid, like he puts a hand up the block and says, you know, you know, I love you. And you're saying it's like, yeah. don't repeat gen- generational like issues in the family. You can yeah. change anything. So yeah, use tools like, you know, talk therapy, antidepressants mm. and all that to deal with the drama from the, the bullshit put personal responsibility in like wills um life insurance and things like that in yeah. for the future but live in the the current you know have a great relationship with your kids try to fix yourself look to improve yourself you know so i always think mm. it's as a kind of three-prong attack and you know take responsibility but you know use these tools that are there we live in a mm. where you can pick up pull out your phone and have the world of free and there's heaps of free resources like Harvard and all these other places, and most people sit on TikTok and then use and they let social media instead of becoming a learning experience, they use it to compare themselves and beat themselves up. Mm. Whereas you know you're judging your entire life against somebody's perfectly snapped picture they've taken thirty times to get the right light to get the right. You know we're mm. judging ourselves. Kids are getting cyberbullied because they don't have the best trainers or. You know, they're not mm. doing this and that. And it's it's that's life I want to change. I want to encourage people to mm. to realize a small change a day might not seem much before you know it. It it changes everything. It how does. do we put like the boundaries in our life? You know, how do we like, you know, how, how do we like connect better with our with our partners, but put the boundaries in? You know, like when is it time to end a relationship? When is it time mm. to end a friendship? You know, what, what do you look for? Is it just, you know, that they don't take personal responsibility, but what else would you look for as a red flag? Well, there's, there, there's obviously going to be lots of red flags. The quickest way of cleaning up your friend group is to hold people accountable. Sit them down. Say, look, this is how I feel about stuff. You know, like you, you, we're on the same team and I want you to come to me. And I've said this to my friends and they do. And they'll hold me accountable. If I fuck up, I need you to be brutal. I need you to come to me. I need you to tell me the things I need to hear, not what I want to hear. And I always say to people, I'm going to tell you what you need to hear, uh, what you need to hear rather than what you want to hear, regardless of the impact on the relationship. If I have to lose you as a friend, because I'm telling you, you're fucking up and you, you're out of control and is you either get on top of it. Because what people don't realize is that's a strength. Because most people that are fair weather friends won't tell you that. They'll just go, yeah, yeah, go along with stuff. Because they're normally part of that pack, right? So what happens is your friend groups gets very small. Once it gets small, you've got the perfect size. Because the thing is, let's pretend there's a table there. Like, depending on where you are in life, the table starts small. Then you get a bit of success. The table turns into a banquet table. Then you fall off because it cycles. Not everyone stays up. That banquet table ends up being a small table again. They're the ones after that cycle is what you want. There's always going to be people hanging on. There's going to be around people for wrong reasons. But the quickest way of cleaning up your friend group is to hold people accountable and let them hold you accountable. And do it respectfully. You don't have to be rude. Because the wrong people hate to be held accountable it's like kryptonite to some people and that'll clear them out of your life really quickly you want to keep away narcissists where where possible everyone runs around calls everyone a narcissist now there are nine traits of mpd and it has to be done by a clinician and basically you've got to meet five of the criterion sometimes that'll be comorbid so a crossover you know a bit of borderline personality disorder histrionics etc and then you've got psychopathy, which is a smaller percentage of the population. A lot of those will be in prison, of course, but there are some high functioning ones. So effectively, if you don't know anything about narcissism or the spectrum, um, the spectrum of cluster B, sorry, then one of the biggest things to understand is you've got to be able to trust your gut. When something doesn't feel right, it's not right. And it depends how someone makes you feel. If you feel a bit 
weird around someone. If someone, it doesn't connect with you. There's something there. You can't ignore your gut. We'll go back to the cyber tooth tiger and obviously cavemen or whenever it was, they're running around. You know, we, we've got this built into our biology. Use hmm. it, right? I say the same to women. It depends how someone makes you feel. If someone makes you feel like trash all the time, they're an energy vampire. Get rid of them. You don't need to know all the technical terms. We don't need to know about love bombing, discard, breadcrumbing. And all. You just need to know they're fucking wrong ones. Go no contact. Get rid of them. Definitely. Yeah. In a relationship, there is no point in being in a relationship, a love bond relationship, i.e. marriage, if there is no desire whatsoever. Because both parties will be fucking miserable. As hard as it sounds, do you want to be miserable for the rest of your life? Because there'd be two people miserable. Because you're never going to measure up. You can't be in a relationship where there's no reciprocity. You can't be the one doing everything carrying the relationship. And then nothing comes back the other way. Yeah? You've got to hold yourself to a level of value. It can be very tricky and complex to go through all these different things to try and understand. Yeah? But if you hold yourself accountable, you take care of yourself, you take care of your mind, your body, your soul, and your money, you don't have to stay where you're not valued. If you're not valued where you are, you move on and you find people that will value you because there will be people out there that value you. I mean, that's a, a big thing I say is see people for who they are, not for who you want them to be. All what happens is people will show you who they are, and when they do, believe them. Just just watch them. Don't take any notice of anyone's words. Watch their actions. Because <coughs> I see people saying, like, you know, like interview your coaches, you know, like at the gym. You know, you don't have to just yeah. take the first trainer they give you. Interview, like, the people that you're wanting to work for as much as going to a job interview. And I'm thinking, but how many people do that with their friend groups? How many people do that Mm. in their relationships? And, you know, if somebody acts a certain way and you're not happy, they're not going to change. A lot of time, unless you're not going to change them, they have to feel it themselves. And yes, it might be horrible to become single again after a long-term relationship. But if you're not Mm. happy now and they're not willing to put the work in, sometimes Mm. it's safest to walk away. Do you, do you know the other thing you got to be careful as well? Self-awareness is so important because there's so many people out there who think the other problem in the relationship is the problem when really it's them because they lack self-awareness to realize. You know, if you had the term reactive abuse, it's where someone would keep digging and pushing away at someone and that person explodes because they've had enough because they're not going to put up with the nonsense. And then they'll go, see, told you. You know, like switching it back on on you. Why you got such a problem done? But really, it's the other person. And the other person reacts. That's why it's called reactive abuse. Very insidious. You have to be very careful of that as well. So being super, you know, being as self-aware as possible. No one's 100% self-aware. There's always going to be stuff we miss. People will listen to this podcast and they'll pick holes on me. They'll go, he's insecure about that. Because they see things I don't see. Do you understand? And I know that. And the more you're self-aware you are and the more you understand who you are as an identity, yeah, who are you? Work out who that is first, yeah? Then become self-aware of your own behaviours. Then you'll be able to model that by watching other people's behaviours. And then you'll get a better, clearer picture if you can live in an objective reality and then make better informed decisions off that, you know? You might be unhappy in a relationship, but you're the cause of the unhappiness for both parties. I love it. Because everybody else blames the other person. Nobody wants to say. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. If you've had a string of jobs, right? You you have a string of jobs. You get fired every six months. Whose fault is it really? If you can't last in a job. Do you understand? That's the Mm -hmm. thing we go, okay. Let's just say that you're in a relationship and you've been fucked over six times in relationships. Six times. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, not five, but six times. There's a pattern there. How do you stop that pattern? You heal the wounds. You find them, heal the wounds, and then you won't do that again. 
do you understand we that's where the other thing is is people that maybe are not conscious of what's going on they're going to attract other people with wounds that go together like a glove if you heal your wounds and you become neurotypical more healthy etc in the middle of the spectrum you're going to attract more people like you not the old you the new you will repel the old the other people if you were to draw in people of that nature you know people that manipulate and stuff I love it. I mean, I, there's so ma- many areas I want to go into, and I know they're like podcasts <laughs> on their own. But I mean, for I mean, you've had a living relationship for 28 years. You know, you've gone down like into th- therapy. You've gone from broke to successful, created businesses, and back again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for people who are listening, okay, and going, brilliant. I'm going to start working on myself. I'm going to do like you were saying, building up this and that. And they're in a relationship they want to make better. They want to have a deeper connection with their partner. You know, they're they're mm. becoming aware because we do become aware of like Joe's problem, John's problem, but we don't see our own problems. How do we start connecting with our partners? You know, like from a guy who's been with somebody for 28 years, you know, you must have figured out this out. How do we deal? We're dealing with our drama ourselves in terms of how yeah. do we make our relationship stronger how do we have that identity as a in a relationship but our own how do we keep the romance alive and avoid the dead bedroom you know how do we okay. just have a good relationship basically all right so this can be a tough area to navigate right because it can be quite complex because we're now dealing with an emotional versus logic plus a mixture of emotions right mm-hmm. All of this has to be handled with care and kindness on your words, right? So let's start with to have a functioner, functioning intimate relationship. There has to be attraction on both sides, yeah? Otherwise, it's going to be a balance in there, right? You've also got to unpick if you've had years of resentment from the past that's built up in the relationship, yeah? Another thing that some guys don't handle correctly is that you don't have the right to a woman's body right you're their partner and they're not your plaything and not to be just picked up when you please right so i think the problem is as well is that intimacy starts outside of the bedroom the lead up starts outside of the bedroom right? but men are very visual and they're ready to go at a drop a hat so <clears throat> whereas most women need to build into it You've seen it, the guy goes up to his wife, want a bit, and she's in the middle of doing something, all stressed out. Reality is, it's not going to happen. Yeah? And then he gets upset, he goes into his cave because he's just been rejected. So first thing is safety, right? So there, there's multiple layers, but the first three layers of safety for a woman is physical, mental, and emotional, right? There are depend more depending on the women, but they need to feel safe in order to open up and express himself right guys also forget sometimes as well foreplay are words as well not just physical foreplay foreplay is words you lead up your text messages and stuff like that you also got to remember that women have many types of orgasms right but only 20 percent or so of women orgasm through intercourse and there's a variety of reasons which I won't go into the on this podcast because we start going down that road of sexual organs and and I'm just trying to keep it at top level as best as possible. It's difficult, so, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And uh and in some cases, some women won't have any orgasms, right? Especially if they're in their head and in the body. You know, we had the, the people would joke, yeah, I was running through the shopping list. The lady needs to feel herself by being in her body and not just in her head to be distracted yeah the other side is not all women want to be like it's a pong show yeah so slow it down and then move for the gears because there are no loads of guys that like jackhammers right but slow it down right so what you want to be able to do is you need to be able to communicate right it's no fun for a woman if you're the only one who's getting it getting off okay so all women are different and they have unique things to them that they enjoy. So you have to understand that. And then there's always, a, as a 
develop and get, you know, grow, there, there, there are other things that will interest them as well. So this stuff will develop half the time. I mean, you've seen why a lot of one night stands end in disaster is because neither party is explored over time. They haven't had that. It's a bit awkward, you know. You might see it on the TV, it all looks like it comes together. But you see how clumsy these things can happen because they don't know each other. Do you know what I mean? They've had a few drinks and stuff like that. So in a long-term relationship, you get to find out what both want and you're able to communicate that, right? Mm. And as crazy as it sounds, are you clean? (laughs) It sounds bad to ask this, but presentation matters, right? Women notice everything from your fingernails, your odour, your breath, your skin, nose hair, everything. And those little subtleties can make a difference as well. So here comes the tough talk. Your partner may not be sleeping with you because you let yourself go, right? So whilst most women are looking for a connection, she still needs to find, you know, find that you're attractive. So look in the mirror and discounting your aging over time. Are you out of shape? And I'm not talking about a six pack here or turn yourself into a Greek god. But self-respect here should be your priority, right? So if you want respect, then that's going to start with itself. You have to understand that a woman can love you but not respect you. And if she doesn't respect you, then there's little chance of desire. Here's the worst thing that can happen, though. You spend a year getting yourself into shape, right? But the union doesn't work out. You've just leveled up. Now you're going to have more options. You will stand out to between 1 in 100 to 300 men in their 40s and 50s because they won't be in the shape as you. You also have to remember that there are no websites or magazines that women consume with plus-size men. There's no, like, do you understand where I'm going from? They're not necessarily looking for that, right? So you also, you've not got women sitting there saying, I must find myself an overweight kind compassionate man that takes care of me and his duties right they're not going to say that to be unkind right there's a difference between being cuddly but then there's a difference between being completely out of proportion and having poor health markers right so if you look at evolutional psychology and the attraction cues these are all generally markers of health you know um if you look at the works of David M. Bust, he'd done a book called The Evolution of Desire. Uh, and there's another book called Why Women Have Sex by Cindy Merton and David M. Bust. They trace back through evolution to the beginning of time to present day and then done these revisions through the book. The final part of that is have you turned into one of the children? So your mother love your mother's love isn't what she's looking to have with you now there's quite a lot of stuff i've gone through there which can be kind of guys listening and going oh i don't you know it's hard to to hear but um we all know men you know visually you know we can stand to the attention and off we go to the races but we have to consider our partners as well of their needs so if you're in a long-term relationship and every week she's not getting what she wants from, you know, the time that you're spending together in the bedroom, they're going to get bored, aren't they? They're not going to be as interested because it's one way. And sometimes what happens because the lack of communication, a lady may think, I want you, I wish you knew how to do it in their head. I wish you knew how to do this. You should be, able, you know, like they don't want to tell you because it kind of spoils it. But at the same time, if they don't tell you, they don't get what they want from it and then becomes a bit of a vicious circle. Mm. And then once you throw children in the mix, raising children, the tired nears, the washing, ironing, and anything that they're doing on, on that level as well, day job, whatever it may be, a woman needs to get into her body and so she needs to feel relaxed to get into that zone. And I think maybe what happens is because that's not communicated enough, the safety elements, the physical, the mental, and the emotional safety as well, 
or that a guy might only show attention at times of when they want sex. The rest of the time, they pretty much ignore their partner or don't pay them any compliments, take care of them, take them out for dinner, da, 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 any of that stuff. And the only time they show attention is then. That becomes a problem as well. So I've kind of unloaded quite a lot of stuff there. But I think that's why 50%, we've got 50% of marriages with their bedrooms out there because there's a lot of guys who don't understand half of what I've just said, that that can play a role, yeah. you know? You've got to remember men and women are different in biologically. We're equal across the board, but we complement each other. But our sexual attractions are differently. The way that we're programmed in that sense are different. And I think it probably takes a lot because... I think it's really unfair on guys when they get shamed. Oh, you want all you want is sex. All I hear about is I want da 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 da. If you turn around and said to a lady, "Oh my God, you're such a narcissist. Why do you need this attention?" You know, that would be very cruel and disrespectful because women need quality attention. They want to feel loved and tend, you know, cared for and stuff. So I'd, that shaming it needs to stop. I think. I think that doesn't help anyone, and that's probably because. Generally, a guy's testosterone is 17 times that of a lady's. So their libido, generally, not always, going to be higher than their partner's. So it's trying to find that happy medium, respectful happy medium. Um, I think the other thing that people have to bear in mind is charity sex, chore sex, using it as a tool, you know, to get things. Yeah. I think... Um, that's a big red flag in a relationship. You want to avoid that. No one wants to feel like a charity. I've spoke to people about this before because I know that experts will talk about that. It's not it, – could you imagine saying to a lady, all right, I'm going to ignore you all week, but on Friday at 4 o'clock for 20 minutes, I'm going to show you some attention. So she waits all week to get a bit of attention. 20 minutes comes around. Okay, you got my full attention. And then you jump on the phone and do that. How would that person feel? Terrible. Bad, yeah. isn't it? Could you imagine saying to someone, I'm going to give you 20 minutes attention? That's what it's like on the flip side. That's why we have to get to a point where whilst we're not biologically the same, we need to have empathy and understanding for each other because there's a lot of men. What, what people don't realize is that a woman would need to feel loved in order to want to make love. And a guy feels loved through the access through sorry, not the access through the activity of making love. That's where he gets his connection. That's where he gets his intimacy. Yeah. And so have you noticed that people with a healthy uh, bedroom scenario, look at them as a couple. Nine times out of ten, no strain, none of the backbiting. You can tell that it's a healthy relationship. And I think what happens is it all starts off well in the very beginning of the relationship, right? Because everyone's turning up being their best selves. But then once everyone goes, well, he's locked down. Oh, I don't need to take her out and be nice anymore. Da, da, da. And then both parties wonder why, well, I'm not getting the attention, physical attention. I'm not getting the emotional attention. And it can become a vicious circle. So as men, we need to make sure that our partners do get good quality attention and care. because then. You will never their bedroom if you have burning desire for each other. No, I hundred percent agree with that. You know, I mean, yeah. I see guys who treat it like uh, I have to get mine, or it's almost like a competition. You know, yeah. and there, there's plenty of tools like sex bucket list, making a yes no maybe list with your partner. But I remember yeah. one of the girls I followed, an influencer, said the hottest thing a guy can do is look at you and say, "What are you into? You know, what what are you into?" And mm. you know. Taking it, just take it away from sex. Treat them like a human being. Treat them like somebody that you love. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. like do things for throw date nights. You know, take off the pressure. And like you're saying, is they they need to feel secure and happy. 
and it shouldn't be a chore. It shouldn't be something that you expect. Or, you know, there's plenty of ways to spice up your love life with toys and all mm. this sort of stuff. But have that connection. Make them feel valued as a person. Make them feel better for being with you. Mm. And, you know, I mean, this would be a podcast that is own about how we can go into and take, you know, boundaries and, like, attention. Mm. But they want to feel loved and happy as much as you do. And as you're working on yourself, also work on that connection with them. Be vulnerable, mm. be open, honest. If they don't want to do it right now, you know, talk, go deal with the issues that are there in the relationship. Then come back, yeah. then build from there. And I think that's something a lot you of guys need to is, do. Yeah, and, and what else is unattractive is desperation. Mm. If that's what they think you know, that can be unattractive as well, but it comes very hard when it's been weeks, months or whatever for some gents who have not had any intimacy. And that's the biggest thing because I think the problem is people don't realise is that's where their connection, the exchange, you know, the oxytocin starts to flow. You think when guys have made love, you know, afterwards, what do you need to get done? Do you know what I mean? It's just like there's almost <laughs> like a new layer appears, yeah? And then what happens, you've got that connection. Let's call it being plugged in. And then it starts to dissipate over time and over time. And then that person uh, doesn't realize that they're just not doing as much. They're not as invested in doing that. Whereas if it's there's a regularity of that connection, the, the closeness is there, then what happens is you're going to do more for each other as well. Nothing becomes beyond too much to do. Do you know what I mean? But there's a difference between that and being manipulated and breadcrumbed and fed it like well uh you, you want a bit you're gonna have to do this or well, you're not getting tonight not how you be you know that kind of it's a doggy biscuit that is toxic and that should be and it's the same as a guy controlling over a woman it's all toxic get that insecure bullshit out of your relationship because you're going to destroy it both of you will and if you can't separate do not put up with that kind of behavior in any relationship. It's going to be hugely damning, damaging, and that will reflect on the kids outside the bedroom as well. Yeah, and it's like they say, it's like, you know, don't try to get your love from somebody else. Find, you know, deal with your issues, find self-love, and then don't expect your connection just by sex, by mm -hmm. being part of what attracted you to that person in the first place. And like you're saying, it's better to be single than be unhappy. And mm. this is a thing a lot of guys are struggling with. They're in unhappy relationships because they think they have to. You know, they don't want to be single. And well, it's because generally, I think, and we've all been through it, is that you, um, you think to yourself, "Will I get anyone else?" So you stay, and you shouldn't do that. And honestly, guys listening, level up in a year. Trust me. You, but, but people won't believe it until they experience the changes of the people around them. Because you've changed. The world hasn't changed. You've changed. You'd be very, very surprised what will happen. Guys are lucky in the sense that they can go on a diet, get in shape, dress better, be more confident, and they can all be a series of attraction cues. You mean a guy can be, I don't like using numbers, a guy could be a four or a five and get to a seven or eight, you know, or a guy can be a six and get to a nine, you know, if you wanted to put numbers by them. We have opportunities because there's various different attraction cues that women find in men. Guys can actually take advantage of that. You know, people go, yeah, but I'm bored. Women will not care if you're bored, if you're in tremendous shape and you look good. Do you understand? So you can offset that, you know. And then you look at, um, yeah, but he's, you're not six foot. I mean, I understand if what you've got to look at is most women do want a guy taller than them. So what's the average height of a woman? Maybe five, two, five, three, five, four. You know, I know you see it online. Yeah, but he's not six foot or they will use filters and you see a big drop off. If I went on dating site, I'd lose out on easy because I'm five foot 11 and a half. In real life, who cares? Do you know what I mean? Because right. I still tower over most women anyway. So don't let that block you. Stay off the dating sites. Absolutely stay off the dating sites. It's going to do you no favors. This whole, I'll hit 100 people. 
and message them will just destroy your confidence and self-esteem unless you're the top 5% of men who they swipe on. Mm. So dating sites for general guys like you and I, if that was the case, don't even do the dating sites. Do everything in person because it's a different world. That's all synthetic. Some people just want your attention. You know, why would you invest hours and hours every night trying to set up dates for only that one person shows out of two or three contacts or you just get played around? It's pointless. Mm. A lot of You're them do it for the attention. You know, you see girls are meeting. It's all for self-esteem regulation. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it is sad, but I mean, it's like treat, focus on your life, regardless of what, if you're in a relationship or whatever, you know, improve yourself, but also then use that confidence, self-esteem, self-love to make your relationship better, to connect better with your kids, you know, and it's, it all starts with you taking that ability, that accountability in your life. And I think we could probably do a podcast on each of these areas and we'll definitely have that back on, but What would you, I know we try to keep this top level and, you know, it's just two hours and we barely touch the surface in a lot of areas, but what would you want people to take from this? You know, if they, if you had to have like a a message or a a call to action for guys who are 40 plus or for any guys listening, really, what would you say to them to, to focus on, to, to self? Everything starts with the self, right? Mm. So if everything around you, if you've got stuff that's not working, the world will not change. It's going to do what it's going to do. You change. And then your world gets better when you make those changes more often than not. So you've always got to focus on yourself. Don't worry about what everyone else is doing. Worry about what you're doing. Take care of your mental health. Take care of your body. Take care of your manners. Take care of your integrity, look after those around you. But everything does come back to the self because you need to be self-aware. You need to have self-respect. You need to be worried about what you're doing in order to become a better person. I'm not talking about being solipsistic or narcissistic. I'm not talking about being selfish. I'm saying start with the self, you know, then work out all the things that you need to work on. Because if you've got a heel, only you can do it. That's the self. Yeah. If you understand who you are, you don't have a full self. You're actually constructed of the self, meaning you know who you are. That's self. If you've got a situation where you want to get in shape and get more healthy and you want to repair that, go down that road, it starts again with you. So it's not about being selfish. But most things can be fixed by focusing on you and working out what you need to do, not what everyone else is doing. Because when you start to level up and you you raise your standards, what happens? Everything around you, the standards go up as well. Because you've raised yours. Meaning, like we spoke about friends earlier on, holding accountability, how to kill off your big friend group into a small one. Go and hold everyone accountable. It's like kryptonite to people. Instantly you know who's on your team, and you're on their team. Instantly, you'll know people that you can trust. Instantly, you're going to know who's real. Hmm. Yeah? Ruthless accountability of what? The self. So it all starts with you. Everything's going to come back to you. If you want to give people better experiences and give your time to people and be a better person, you've got to work on you. So focus on that. Don't worry about what Bob next door doing, the neighbour you fucking hate, or that shit on Facebook, or someone on TV that bugs you. Because that's another thing. You know when people get angry and triggered by stuff on Facebook? That's the shadow projection. So what's happened? You get triggered by that because there's something in there within you. People don't realise that as well. And we didn't even get into talking about doing shadow work and stuff like that because everyone has a dark and a light side and the idea is that you would integrate it. But it all begins and ends with you. Accountability, responsibility, self-awareness, everything. Because it's it's going to be a hard job, like a lot of hard work and there's a lot of stuff we can cover in the next one. But Mm. I think that's the thing is people need to stop looking out with, they need to look in and realize yeah. true change true happiness comes from there and 
I That's love why that. it's called internal locus of control, not externally. It's internal. This is why you have agency, sovereignty. This is why you're an independent human being that individuates, that's separated from everyone else. It becomes, it's down to you, the self. I love it. I love, uh, you've got such a great voice for this as well. You've got such a great understanding of it and the ability to be open and not helpful to so many people after everything you've been through and to come out of it and say, I want to help people. That is such a yeah. unique way of doing it. And until we can get you back on, what would you want people to do now? How can mm. they keep in touch? How can they find you in social media? You know, because I think you've got to do a plus 40 program. I think you've got to get the books and the TED Talks. How can we keep mm. in touch with you and follow you on this amazing journey? I'm, I'm just right now, it's just uh, at men plus 40 on Instagram. Uh, I haven't really de developed out much of the other socials. I drop content every day, normally video uh, content. i have launching the Men Plus 40 podcast quite soon, so I've been recording some episodes for that. So we'll, you'll see some of the short-form content before the long-form content comes out. I think the podcast will be launched in about six weeks. But right now, it's just been focusing on what we're doing and the structure for men plus 40. I've got a sketched outline for the book for the evolved man. Um, we'll see how that goes. That's starting to take shape in terms of topics, etc. Uh, we'll be launching a brand as well. My wife's a product formulator and obviously I have background in commerce. So I'd like to launch a men plus 40 brand for products for, for men. Um, and also I'm looking because of the conferences as well. I'd love to do in the UK a Men Plus 40 conference, and I've kind of penciled that in for September 24. It sounds like a long way away, but when you put conferences together, it takes about a year, really, with the planning, the lineup, mm. and everything else. So, yeah, just starting the Instagram, start there, then the podcast, then the book, then the conference, and then we'll launch the brand as well further down the road. But most importantly now is really is to focus around the content and get that to people first and to get a feel for what we're trying to do and, and trying to help men evolve. Well, that's it for another week. And thank you for listening. It's now time to take what you've learned and use it to develop and enhance your life with the key points mentioned. Listen, try it, embrace it, use it, and crush it. Now's your time to hit that next level in your life. If you liked this episode, then please leave a comment on the show notes or a review of the show on your podcast platform. Everything helps evolve the show. Until next week, keep seeking the next level in your life.